Large technology companies have no shortage of data, but raw data itself does not provide a competitive advantage. Many companies are bottlenecked by a shortage of data scientists who can query that data effectively. This results in an organizational dysfunction where people lining up to ask questions of the data science team are unable to move as fast as they want to because they can't get that data that they need as fast as they would like. Tomasz Tungus saw this when he was working at Google, and he continues to see it today from his position at Redpoint, where he works as a venture capitalist looking at companies. The problems with the data supply chain that he sees at many companies led him to write Winning with Data, a book about how technology companies can successfully operationalize, explore, and act on their data. He's got numerous positive and negative case studies for how companies are winning with data or potentially losing with data. We've done many shows about the interactions between software engineers, data engineers, and data scientists. And this episode is a great complement to the previous episodes. It provides a holistic view into the way that data moves through an organization. And I highly recommend Tomasz's book, Winning with Data. It's a great read, and it's a quick read because it's very entertaining and has some great anecdotes. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Tomasz. Indeed Prime flips the typical model of job search and makes it easy to apply to multiple jobs and get multiple offers. Indeed Prime simplifies your job search and helps you land that ideal software engineering position from companies like Facebook or Uber or Dropbox. Candidates get immediate exposure to top companies with just one simple application to Indeed Prime. And the companies on Prime's exclusive platform message the candidates with salary and equity up front. Indeed Prime is 100% free for candidates. There are no strings attached. Sign up now and help support Software Engineering Daily by going to indeed.com slash sedaily. That's indeed.com slash sedaily if you're looking for a job and want a simpler job search experience. You can also put money in your pocket by referring your friends and colleagues. Refer a software engineer to the platform and get $200 when they get contacted by a company and $2,000 when they accept a job through Prime. You can learn more about this at indeed.com slash prime slash referral. That's indeed.com slash prime slash referral for the Indeed referral program. Thanks to Indeed for being a continued sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. If I ever leave the podcasting world and need to find a job once again, Indeed Prime will be my first stop. Tom Tungus is the author of Winning with Data. Tomas, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you. So your book, Winning with Data, is about a shift in how successful companies operate. And there are a number of observations that you explore, and I thought that the most relevant one that I really wanted to start with, particularly because this is a show about engineering, is the accessibility of data within a company. And basically, the, this idea that companies collect so much data, but this key observation that you make is that even if a company collects tons of data, there's a there's a big bottleneck in the company if there's only one person that can actually service the engineers or the marketers or whoever is requesting the aggregation or the uh, refined result of that data. So... Why is that observation important? It's a really important observation. Um, so let me give you an example. Uh, my wife and I met at Google. She's still there. And uh, Google's a really big uh, company with lots and lots of data. And even for her, it's such a sophisticated company, it's really difficult for her to access data. And so uh, if she has a question or someone on her team has a question, she has to know the person inside the company who... Um, is managing that data, and that you know that person. Then they have to have a, some kind of a conversation about what it is that she's looking for, and and so to get the answer to a question, it's it can be complicated. And at most businesses, that's the case. You have to know somebody. You have to make a friend. You got to buy them a beer. You got to get them to do a favor, because um, there are only a few people inside the company who understand how all this data interleaves, right? So you've got data that's coming from sales, data that's coming from marketing, data that's coming from engineering. Other places, and let's say you're a marketer and you really want to understand how a particular marketing campaign performed. 
And you want to measure it in a bunch of different dimensions. First, you want to measure it on how effective your spend was, which means you're going to need both the marketing data and then you're also going to need the sales data. And then you also want to understand whether or not the quality of the customers that you bought through that campaign were good customers and they stayed around. So you also probably want some customer support, customer success data to understand were they high workload, were they not. And so now all of a sudden you're joining three different data sets, right? And the marketer is un- going to understand all the different metrics that a marketer would, and cost of customer acquisition, campaign IDs, what the different, you know, um, what the different media were. But they may not necessarily know what the Salesforce objects look like, and they're probably not going to understand what kinds of metrics the customer support team looks like. You know, it might be customer satisfaction, that promoter score. And so, you know, maybe there's one or two people inside of a company who understand how all that comes together. Um, but in most companies, it doesn't happen. And so <clears throat> what ends up happening is, you know, in the book, we call it these data breadlines, right? Yeah. And the notion of a breadline is there's somebody waiting for something. Um, and what we found inside of companies when we, we did all these case studies with Looker was that a lot of these breadlines are invisible. Like I'm somebody inside of a company. I have this question, this burning question about this marketing campaign that we ran. And I really want to under- understand it. But the friction to getting the answer is so high that um, – that I might try once, and then the person who I've asked to to, uh, to run the analysis doesn't get it quite right because they're not familiar with the domain, and so they have to go back once or twice. But at some point, I'm going to feel bad enough, or I don't want to go back that nth time to right. get the data, that I'm not going to get the answer to my question. So the problem there is you develop a chilling effect within the organization where people are literally afraid to ask for something because... Then it erodes their relationship with yeah. the data scientists that can re- that can actually query the data set. And then if something uh, even more pertinent comes up in the future, perhaps you've developed a bad relationship with this data scientist. So this is really, in, in some ways, it's an organizational problem. Yeah. In other ways, it's a technology problem. Like your you, my sense from reading the book is you are somewhat of an optimist. You believe we can develop technologies that can eat, eat away at this data breadline problem where you have to wait and you have to, there's a, there's a person in the loop, you know, uh, we would imagine that, or you, you imagine optimistically that there will be tools that can let the data driven marketer just get answers to her or his own questions, uh, immediately. Yeah. Um, so, um, could you like explain that more? Because, uh, you know, to, to someone who's naive looking at this, you know, you, you think about a complex query where there's like three data sets in, involved and you have to do these complex joins. It almost starts to sound like the feature of a software application. It sounds that complex. And, you know, we've never been able to uh, allow non-engineers to really develop uh, feature-rich complexity for applications, although there's been all kinds of promises throughout the years. So why is data a different problem than the application development side of things? Yeah, it's, well, so what ends up happening most of the time you see is like, a company gets to, and you know, we track this through a bunch of case studies, but a company starts out and um, there are 16 to 20 people and then all of a sudden somebody wants access to data. And so it falls on the shoulders of some engineer to develop a dashboard for this person, which is basically an SQL query that has some parameters for dates, right? And then that's visualized in a web browser. And that's how most business intelligence and analytics tools work, which is, let me construct an SQL query, let me make it a quick web UI on top so that I can change the parameters, and then the business user, whoever's analyzing the data, can modify it, right? And that's a that's a quick and dirty solution, right? And then you see, at some point, uh, companies become more sophisticated, and they start asking far more complex questions. So they're, they're, they're questions with joins, or they're questions with like window functions. And what they have to do then is either they teach their employees SQL, right? And some companies do that, or they, they, it falls back on the engineers to figure out something, right? Like do a data dump into Excel for a particular set of queries that are run every night. And um, for most startups, that job is um, second order priority. And so people inside the company don't get access to data. And the technology that really um, changes all this is data modeling. And so Data modeling is a domain-specific language, uh, and Looker has this, and this is why we invested in Looker. Um, Looker has this data modeling tier, which is, it looks like YAML, and it basically allows someone who understands how the data is structured to encode the joins and the relationships between data once. And that includes, like, hey, 
match this ID, you know, this foreign key to this primary key, and this is how you can do this join. Or, but it also includes things like this is a metric that people care about seeing on a daily, weekly, and quarterly basis. So make that a default. Whenever you present this data, allow it to be rolled up this way. Um, and so those are just really simple examples of how you do data modeling. But it means that once I model the data the, the way that Salesforce and Zendesk correlate once, and I put that into the development environment inside of Looker, anybody else in the company can manipulate data at, with that join as if they knew what I know. So you're talking about an improvement in tooling. It sounds like it comes with a, uh, a necessary um, improvement in education like because you have to learn to deal with this type of YAML uh, domain-specific language. Um, talking more broadly, what are the types of organizational changes that have to take place? Uh, you worked at Google. Google has uh, a very unique culture. How how did they bake that into their culture? Because my sense is they did it both with internal tooling and with certain organizational strategies that uh, tried to get around this data breadline problem. Yeah. The first thing, well, um, the first thing they did is for a very long time, all the data was accessible to everybody. Uh, the second thing they did is they really, um, they allowed and, well, so there was this culture of like, um, there's this language called Sawzall inside of Google which was uh, some kind of a query language that you could run on top of like MapReduce, effectively a MapReduce job. And so as a product manager, I was a product manager, you were trained on Sawzall. And there was another one called, uh, 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 it's called, uh, anyway, it's an SQL-based interface on top of it. I forgot. It was the Sawzall V2. It was the Sawzall V2. Uh, yeah, and it's called. This is the one, was this the one that Dremio was based on? Yeah, it's well. Yeah, the Dremio Apache project is called Drill. Oh, Drill, right? Yeah, and then this one was called um, Dremel. Dremel, right? Yeah. So it's called. It was called Dremel, and basically everybody was given access to these tools. And then um, there's a there was a culture, and I think still exists inside of Google of like self education. So there are all these wikis and these uh, places where you could learn and pick up the language. And so it was really encouraged. You know, as a product manager, when you launch a feature, before you launch a feature, you would actually go through the Google blocks or whatever information that was relevant for you and you could come up with some hypothesis or look at the impact and that was really empowering because all of a sudden you could ask and answer your own questions and you're equipped to do that so but you had to learn sql or i knew sql before coming in yeah and so um at the time google product managers mostly had all were required to have computer science degrees and uh so that helped a lot too right um and, but because of that, we could access this data and actually make lots of decisions uh, based on it and share it with our team. And then the other thing was, because you had the name of the person who wrote Sawzall on some wiki, if you had a question, you could go to that person. There, was a, you know, there were groups that you could email. And, um, and so you could educate yourself pretty quickly or get what, what you wanted. And so um, that's been pretty important. As, and as we wrote the book, we started looking at other companies big companies, innovative companies, and small companies, what they do in order to kind of create this data literacy. Because that's really what um, I think was one of the brilliant things about Google was they actually allowed their people to become more and more data literate and they encouraged it. Like um, they would bring in different speakers, like the guy who wrote a visual display of quantitative information, like oh. the yeah, seminal book on, you know, he would come in all the time and took his class. And, um, and uh, so they really encouraged it. And but the, so the most important thing, and what we found in the book was, or in the case studies was, you needed two things. First, you needed, you really needed an executive team that that believes in data decision making, database decision making. And then the second thing you need is, you need a team that's responsible for educating people inside the company. And so like at Facebook, your office hours, standing office hours, also exists at Avant Credit and a bunch of other companies. And so there's a data team that's responsible for three or four different things. First is uh, tooling, so picking the tools. The second is um, education. So, th and that means these are all the data sets that exist within the business that you can access. This is how you analyze them. And then the third thing is they do office hours. So they, you know, a marketer says, I have this problem. There's a dedicated time on Thursday. They can go in and say, okay, here, let's solve this project together. And that kind of breaks this, um, you had a really good word for it, but like this freeze of the data breadline because all of a sudden I know I can go to a place where I don't have to expend a significant amount of social capital to get the answer that I'm looking for. So 
So you've got a bacon delivery service, and you need to notify your customers when their bacon has arrived at their doorstep. Twilio helps you make sure your customers get the bacon while it's hot. Twilio's programmable API lets you build SMS or voice alerts easily in the programming language of your choice, all in under five minutes with only a few lines of code. Now your customers get a text or a call the instant their bacon is ready. If your customers want to see the bacon frying on a hot pan, Twilio has video APIs and SDKs for the platforms that you know and love. Learn more at go.twilio.com slash podcast and get an additional $10 when you sign up and upgrade your account. That's go.twilio.com slash podcast. You will only pay for what you use and it costs less than a penny to send a text. Get started at go.twilio.com slash podcast. Get your bacon delivery service cooking with Twilio's APIs for voice, SMS, and video. So, okay, what about the question of identifying what data you should be focused on? So, like, for example, you worked at the AdSense team at Google. Uh, you describe this really complex equation that your manager had written on a whiteboard or a chalkboard or something, and it was just it's, I, I just had this vision of like you know the grand unifying theory yeah. of, of AdSense <laughs> and all these different variables that are plugged in, um, and you know I can I can envision um, you know you could build that kind of equation for for any type of product, and you would have all kinds of things that you should focus on, so. Uh, you know, when we're not talking about the tooling, when we're talking about the higher level, uh, deciding what to focus on, yeah. and and then deciding what questions to drill into, because obviously, you know, knowing what questions to ask is is a uh, you know that, that's everything. that's a, that's everything. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. You know, if you don't know what question you're asking, then yeah, uh, you know, then you don't even know what qu- it doesn't even matter if you're great at SQL. You don't know what question to ask the database. Yeah. So how uh, you know how did you? Uh, how did that work at Google? Or like maybe you could use the AdSense example as you know because there's all these all types of organizations where, like I worked at Amazon briefly. At Amazon, you could optimize infinitely. Like there's so many different levers you can pull. Uh, you know, if you're on a if you're on a team, how do you identify the thing that you should be focusing on the most, the data lever that you should be pulling the most? Maybe you could use the AdSense team as an example. Yeah. No, you're right. It's like Alice in Wonderland, right? If you don't know where you're going, every road will take you there. Um, there's a there's a great example. There's a NetSuite example um, that I'll use. So NetSuite's a publicly traded company that provide uh, financial software, mostly for mid market. So their average price point at IPO is around ten thousand dollars, and they um, they've got this amazing CFO. His name is Ron Gill, and uh, Ron Gill was he and his team were looking at the lifetime value of a customer. So if you take the sum total of the revenue from an individual customer, how do you maximize that over time? And they really wanted to understand. Um, how they could double it again because it was growing pretty quickly and they wanted to double it again. And so there, there are three key parts of lifetime revenue. The first is the average revenue a customer pays. And then the second is the number of months or years you retain them uh, or the churn rate. And then the, the third is the gross margin, which is how much, uh, you know, how cost effective it is to actually serve this customer. And what he and his team did is, well, first, it's, it's important to note that like a 1% improvement in any of those three things results in the same improvement to LTV uh, just because of multiplication. Um, but the, the, the more important thing is to try to figure out what's easiest for the business to change, right? If, if a 1% improvement across those three buckets is equal in value to the improvement in LTV, which is the easiest one to change, right? And so what they did is they took that composite metric LTV, they broke it down into those three sub buckets, and then they broke down all the individual metrics that fed into those three. And they started running linear regressions, which is really simple linear regressions. And they figured out that churn rate was the one that they could improve the easiest. And so for about two years, they focused on churn rate. And again, they doubled LTV. And then after the end of two years, they got to the point where they couldn't improve churn rate anymore because the only businesses that were leaving NetSuite were the ones that were going out of business themselves, right? So no marginal improvement to be had there. And so the next thing they focused on is uh, average revenue per customer. And so then the strategy was, hey, can we move up market? Can we pursue larger and larger clients? 
And so I think, you know, if you can, if you can start with one of those composite metrics, like what is it, every company, every business has maybe three goals that they really care about. It could be like revenue growth or cost reduction. You start with one of those metrics, you break it down into what the contributing factors are. And then you look at, um, you look at what the relationships are and where it's easiest to actually transform, right? And that involves talking to the team, understanding the dynamics and what it, and you can do this analysis at a company level, right? Like NetSuite did, or you can do, even do it as a department level. So in AdSense, you know, I was working on social networking features. So we were taking information from social networks and we we're using it to target ads. And we could do things like the key metrics for us were, the one key metric was revenue per thousand impressions, like revenue per page, basically. And the contributing factors there were the amount of money the advertiser was willing to pay for that ad impression. And then the number of, um, con- the number of impressions we were able to show. Yeah. And then the last was... Um, the, the percentage rate that users engage with that ad, my click-through rate. Uh, and so, you, you know, we could have done basically exactly the same analysis to figure out what is the thing that we can move the most. Is it, can we improve our targeting and is that can improve our click-through rate? Or is there a, a new advertising sales effort, uh, which we ended up doing to, you know, promote social media advertising and therefore we can increase demand for advertisers for this particular inventory and improve revenue per thousand impression. I think that's how you start. Okay, so getting back to the question of teams yeah. and organizations, um, maybe in the portfolio companies that you have, you've probably seen the rise of this data engineering sector. I mean, for 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 the last decade or so, we've seen the rise of the role of the data scientist yeah. as a labeled position or a team within a company. And then more recently, we've kind of had this revelation where Uh, oh my goodness, the data infrastructure that the software engineers are trying to build for the data scientists has gotten so complex that the software engineers can't simultaneously keep up with the data engineering and, you know, whatever Java backend they're building or or Rails backend. And then simultaneously, like, the data scientists are too busy boning up on statistics and machine learning to actually know how to wire together Kafka and Spark and whatever other uh, uh, mechanisms they're building. So you get the rise of this data engineering team that's that's responsible for, uh, you know, patching together the infrastructure that will serve the data scientists or perhaps serve the software engineers for building features maybe that the data scientists say they should build. Um, how have you seen that role, uh, or that team develop within organizations that you're looking at? Yeah, I think, uh, well, so initially what ends up happening is you have an engineer and then you have a, somebody, a data consumer in the business somewhere. And so you have two roles. And then, and then what ends up happening is the, the, the business analyst decides they need some more sophisticated analysis. They hire this data scientist, right? Let's just call him a statistician, much easier term. Uh, and then the statisticians, they start performing enough analysis that they start, that they begin to tax the infrastructure. And, um, and so then either, you know, some, some people in the engineering team move into data engineering or they hire somebody specifically to do this, right? And like you said, this is, this is all the mechanisms to get data out of production systems into analytic systems and help them scale. There's a DevOps component to it. So I wonder at some point, maybe, you know, these people are called like data ops because that's really what they do. And this is a function that um, historically really hasn't existed. Um, And it hasn't existed for a bunch of different reasons. The first is um, data used to be the end goal, right? Like your goal was to fill up uh, an ERP or like a CRM, and you weren't actually doing anything with this data. And now that it's really cheap to store and it's it's much easier to analyze and people want to analyze it, it's becoming more and more important. And, you know, I was talking to like a Fortune 500 um, head of data and he was telling me uh, a really interesting change has happened for him it used to be that his team would buy one analytic solution for the whole company and everybody would use it. and now he no longer has that decision individual departments are making the purchasing decisions marketing buys their own shadow it shadow it and so his role is no longer to provide end-to-end from the data through to the bi tool his role is to provide an infrastructure that allows anybody to plug in whatever analytic system they want into a common architecture, a common data infrastructure, so that everybody is happy, right? And so that's far more sophisticated a challenge than building one data pipeline to service a data cube with a BI tool on top. Right. So, so yeah, so, so you're basically saying in that type of Fortune 500 company, you would have, uh, they would build like a core data infrastructure that makes sense for all of the consumers and some kind of like, Kafka plus, uh, you know, some kind of database system, and then whatever team 
uh, any team can can plug in whatever Tableau or some other kind of BI tool, or is it or is it tools that are lower down the stack? No, no, that you got exactly right, okay. exactly what you said. Okay. And so this data engineering team is responsible for getting data out of transactional databases into analytics databases, um, merging the data, right? So if you need to do transformations or anything like that, managing the data pipelines, making sure that if there's a report that needs to run every day because there's some other process that picks it up to you know perform some analysis. Um, that that that's being executed, uh, and so that's that's the role of this data engineering team. I think um, it's a totally underappreciated role, um, but it's a critical. It's a really critical role. So the book "Winning with Data" that we're talking about, you explore management principles. You explore lean management principles, um, and we've seen lean applied to software engineering. How does lean and other management principles that you explore in the book, how does that apply to the world of data, the world of data science, the world of teams interacting together to uh, find solutions? Yeah, I think the most important thing, there's a guy named Dominic Orr, who was EO of Aruba, and he gave this great talk at Stanford. And, um, you know, he, he was asked, like, you know, basically in one form or another, what do you attribute your team's success to? And he has this notion of, uh, he said, Startups and innovative companies, their key advantage is speed. Uh, they they out execute everybody. They have an insight and and then they they run faster. And um, and in order to keep that speed going, the key principle within a management team is something he called, and I love this moniker, brutal intellectual honesty. And he meant that um, basically there's no ego in the room, right? The best argument wins no matter who articulates that argument. And I think that if you really want to be a data-driven company, you have to embrace this principle, right? And that's because, um, like, there's a story, there's a story from uh, one of the case studies that we did where uh, there's this really prominent SaaS company and um, the product management team has just released a feature. And they are asking the product marketing team to promote this feature uh, through in-app or in-product messaging. And the, the... they have this meeting because the product marketing team is not really sure like how impactful this is going to be, how broad of an audience it's going to have. And uh, there's this one girl, uh, we changed her name for the book, but I think I call her Stephanie in the book. And uh, she spends about 10 minutes in the corner of this meeting room and she runs a bunch of queries. And uh, all of a sudden she realized, she said, hey, it turns out out of the 20,000 or so customers, only 27 of them care about this feature, right? And so you need, a, in order to be a data-driven organization, it has to be okay that she runs that analysis and it has to be okay that she stands up and says, excuse me, everybody, only 27 customers care. Right, so what about the counter-argument that if you... So I'm a fan of that type of culture. Yeah. What about the counter-argument that if the culture over-indexes on that kind of thinking, you end up with like local maxima features yeah. and, and you don't get the type of thing where you say, oh, okay, we need to, you know, we're in an innovator's dilemma trough or something. We need to totally shift our model and there's no way we can have data to support this but we need to do this nonetheless yeah yeah so it's a really good point so (coughs) excuse me uh so jeff bezos talks about how there are two different kinds of product development there's a product development that where you start with the the strengths of the company and you anticipate given the strengths of the company what the user is going to want Apple embodies that, right, under jobs, right? It just kind of creates category after category. And then the second kind of product development category or technique is to start with the problems of the customer and then build in. Sure. Right? And so I think in the first one, uh, and in the early stages of almost every startup, data is not going to get you there. Like you can't, like you, you can't sit, you can't become an EIR, an entrepreneur residence at a venture firm, run a bunch of linear regressions or random forests, whatever you want, <laughs> and come up with the next great idea, right? Like, it's just not going to happen. Um, and so in that case, yes, data will completely fail at finding a local maximum or a global maximum or whatever. Data is really useful once, you know, it's basically after you've established product market fit yeah. or after you've rolled out your product and you're looking to test. And what you're really looking for is optimization, right? Like, this is how do you get a 50% improvement or 100% improvement or a 2% improvement out of your existing uh, systems? This is not, it's not a... Um, it's basically a tool to narrow down the different options. It's not an idea creation tool. Yeah, I like the the Amazon example and um, you know what what Bezos always talks about is so interesting. It's just like you never want to get in a position where you have to throw a hail mary as a company. Like you want to be in a position where you can throw hail yes. marys. Yeah. 
but you want those Hail Marys to be hedged by, you know, a very successful e-commerce business and cloud business <laughs> yeah. when you try to do your Hail Mary Fire Phone thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so um, and I th- so another interesting example you have in the book is Pixar, and Pixar is obviously a very honest culture. If you read the that book, um, Creativity Inc. Creativity Inc. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but what's interesting is like Pixar. It strikes me as a company where it's hard to be data driven because they have this yearly. They have essentially have a yearly release cycle, right? It's just yeah. like a movie comes out, <laughs> yeah. and then they can do research Dude. against that, and <laughs> yeah. that's like a yearly release cycle, basically. Yeah. Um, so, how do you have a data driven company? When you're Pixar and you can't do like A-B test, I mean, maybe eventually they'll have like A-B testing and they have the movie, you know, they push updates to the movie uh, every, you know, every week or so. But um, yeah, how would, I mean, yeah. what's your sense of that? So I think for a company like Pixar and in Catmull's book, he describes it, I think it's less about the data and it's more about this concept of intellectual honesty. And so he really talks about um, how they have this group of people inside the business. It's called the brain trust. And the brain trust are people that, I think everyone within the company kind of chooses as uh, really exceptional people. And the brain, like um, uh, Pixar is structured so that there are different uh, studios. You know, one might be working on Toy Story X and then the other one's working on the sequel to Dory and, you know, the robot movie, um, whatever it is. And and so each of these studios are on different cycles uh, for production. And the director for those is responsible for creating the story arc with the team. And periodically, I think it's every two weeks, they get together with a brain trust. And these, pe- these are people who are experts because they've released lots of films. They're highly regarded. They come from different points of view. And they all have a very honest conversation about exactly where the movie is, right? And um, there's a story in the book when the CEO of Pixar, uh, Catmull, you know, I think they're working on Toy Story 1. And they're about six months into it. And they, uh, the brain trust decides that... Um, the brain trust decides that the, the story isn't strong enough and it's not going to resonate with people. And so they start from zero. They kind of move the management team aside and they restart, which is which for them at the time was a financially very difficult uh, position to be in. I mean, it was story, Toy Story 2. And, uh, and that's the really hard decision, right? And, and like um, when I was at Google, I, this actually happened a lot. So uh, when you're, I was in this program that Marissa Meyer ran called the Associate Product Manager Program. And it's like a two-year management training program. And in addition to your core responsibilities as an APM, you also have these like ancillary, ancillary responsibilities. And so uh, one of uh, like Pete Kuman, he was responsible for OKRs, right? And so he worked with the executive management team to create uh, OKRs and other, other people were responsible for other things. And my responsibility was this thing called product review. So every quarter, Eric Clary and Sergey wanted to review every project inside Google. And, uh, and so it was my responsibility to kind of figure out what all the projects were and then schedule them for this three-hour window on Fridays and then take notes. And, um, you know, the number of times that, and I think must be it's a very hard thing to do, the number of times when a team came in um, and basically the management team said no to a project, even at like the last minute, um, it, was, it wasn't infrequent, mm-hmm. right? And uh, it's the same idea. Like even, and it wasn't necessarily that those decisions were data-driven, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it was that everybody in the room was intellectually honest about either – like the approach wasn't going to work or the market wasn't that attractive or the execution of the team hadn't been successful or whatever, you know, whatever factor it was. Right. Now, so so is, is, is the idea of focusing on the intellectual honesty, that component of the book, is that, uh, do you focus on that because it's a necessary complement to a data-driven culture? I mean, it almost sounds like, because I mean, you could, if you have a super rich, complex data set, you could manufacture an argument in favor of anything or against anything so it seems like intellectual honesty is like a pretty good check against that yeah i mean you can cut the data right like you can eliminate outliers you can you can uh reduce the set to to tell a particular story and so like anything data is a tool it can be used for good uh it's like a lightsaber it can be used for good it can be used for evil um and so if you need to have the values in the organization so we're sitting here at Redpoint, where you now work as an investor. What kinds of data systems have you built internally here that help with decision making? We have built um, two different kinds of data systems. The first are uh, sourcing systems. So how do we find interesting companies? And so we crawl the internet and a bunch of other different data sources, and um, they basically 
put all those all the potential companies and startups that we haven't yet seen into a bin and then we review the bin and so it's a sourcing effort and then the second is um you know we had this uh we had this question about whether or not we were making systematic uh we had systematic bias in our decision making process and so we have a a little voting app that we use um to get everybody to say exactly how they feel or think about a particular investment opportunity and then we run analysis on that to see whether or not we're you know biased to particular sectors or away from particular kinds of investment wow okay so did you look at like bias of gender and age and all kinds of stuff like that too it's not that sophisticated yet it's right now it's on because you know what you really want is frequency of use and you don't want the survey to be so enormous that uh it's slow and so it's still you know we're probably just a couple quarters into the experiment so we're still tweaking and tuning it Mm. um but yeah, so it's a work in progress. I think, you know, one of the things I'm most excited about at RedPoint is um, we're really adopting this culture of experimentation the way that we did at Google, which is, hey, let's try things and, and see what works and see what doesn't and abandon the things that don't work. And so, Can you give an example? Well, I, this voting app is a great example, okay. I think, yeah. Um, and so we'll see if it works, if it works for us. And, you know, if we, because like what you really want to see is, okay, we're consistently biased, biased against a particular kind of market, right? Or we're, we're consistently biased against a... Um, I don't know, something else. And, uh, and so then, then the question is, how do we... The hard part is, let's say we run this analysis for a year and the data is inconclusive. <laughs> then you're like, okay, <laughs> was that worth anything? You know. And then the third part to consider is he- the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and all this, which is once we start measuring it, do, do our behaviors change? Sure. And so... Are you, if, are you acting in a biased way because you're being measured? Yes, or are we less biased because we are measured? And so abandoning the project, even though the data is inconclusive, is the wrong decision. The Circonus Monitoring and Analytics platform is a leader in accurate monitoring and custom analytics for any tech at any scale. For six years, Circonus has given engineers the tools that they need to understand the behavior of their systems. Whether it's leveraging anomaly detection and alerting tools to quickly adapt to unexpected changes, or accessing the flexible analytics solutions to plan your resource allocation, Circonus is the go-to platform that enables you, the engineer, to answer the questions that support your problem-solving goals. If you want to learn about how to better understand the behavior of your systems with a monitoring tool that you can trust, go to circonus.com slash sedaily for your free trial. Circonus is built by and for engineers, and they know that inaccurate data from monitoring tools can lead to bad decisions, and that's why their platform stores data using histograms, which enables recall of the entire distribution of data. It's not just compressed or averaged data for uh, for your alerting. You, you get accurate alerting and reporting data that you can trust. This method is not used by most competitors in the monitoring space, many of whom may not even guarantee an accurate measurement for a 99% service level agreement, uh, let alone the service level agreements that your customers require of you, which may be higher than 99%. Again, to check out Circonus, go to circonus.com slash sedaily. It would support the show and you would get a free trial. Circonus offers smarter monitoring for smarter engineers. Check it out at circonus.com slash sedaily. Thanks to Circonus for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. We really appreciate it. Now, aren't there reasons to be biased sometimes? Like, I mean, you don't want to become, tra- you don't want to track the market, right? Because the market is, you know, market will get overheated on whether it's Bitcoin startups or VR, and maybe you have a thesis about the market. I mean, this is this can be, you know, you could you could build a venture capital firm around the thesis that Bitcoin is 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 useless, or the tech is never going to get there. So it seems like as an investor, sometimes you do want biases because you don't want to just become like an index venture. Right. Well, yeah. So you know, there's this great two by two. I don't know who did it, which is, you know, in order to make lots of money in venture, you have to be non-consensus and right. Right. Any other bucket. If you're consensus and right, you won't make a great return because you won't have any alpha. And if you're wrong, <laughs> you don't make any money either. So you have to be non-consensus and right. And so, you know, it's a very good point, right? Which is um, 
why we really push to have a non-consensus decision-making process at that point, right? Uh, it's a minority of people who can say yes to an investment and we will make it. And that's because uh, some of our best investments were the most controversial. Hmm. What's an example? Netflix. Ah. Yeah, Netflix almost went out of business three times. And uh, it was one of those, I wasn't around at the time, but my partner, Tim Haley, um, he was the one and, you know, he he was, um, I've only been told the story, but he was adamant. I mean, he was, um, he was, oh, what's an even more forceful word than adamant? Uh, anyway, he, he just, we had to be, you know, his point of view is we had to Ferocious. be Ferocious. Yeah. Yeah. He just, there was, there was no alternative, right? Uh, there was only one path. And so he really, really wanted to invest in this company. And uh, everyone else had, you know, and I think quite rationally, a lot of skepticism about um, a company that was going to build facilities to manage, in the success case, millions of DVDs going through the mail. Sure. So uh, when you, like, think back about that decision, obviously, you know, you weren't here, but retros- it's retrospective nonetheless. Like, uh, is there a... Uh, data-driven thesis to take away from that or is it more like trust your gut when it comes to like if you have somebody who says we should absolutely follow Reed Hastings wherever he goes or yeah I don't know like I think I think being a venture capitalist means investing in exceptions right and so um, I think if you like you know Tim knew knew the business and he thought it was an exceptional business and so you have to have enough trust right this goes back like you can't Analyze everything. If you analyze everything, like basically what's going to happen is you're going to invest along using a Gaussian distribution. You're always going to invest in the mean. And that's not, you know, you, in order to generate outsized returns, you can't look at the mean company or the mean idea. You have to kind of look at the ideas that are in the tails. So I don't know, like in the earliest stages, and I ran the analysis for SaaS companies. So I was really curious, like for a SaaS company, how correlated is the pre money valuation to the revenue? Turns out the R squared is like less than 0.2. So I don't know what that means. Oh, uh, they're uncorrelated. Oh, yeah. So the R squared is a measure from zero to one about how how like negative one to one about how correlated something is. Zero means there's absolutely no correlation. One means they're perfectly correlated. They move in sync. And negative one means they're negatively correlated. When one goes up, the other hmm. one goes down. So, and what did you take away from that? That finding that there was no correlation was it just uh, people who were making the investments tended to. Underestimate, underestimate the market size or underestimate how much the customers would spend or what was the... No, I think the conclusion is that um, the price the startup commands in the market is driven more by the demand for the startup in the market ah. rather than a financial metric, right? So if you have seven investors competing for a particular investment, the price for price per share for one of those shares is going to go up. There's more demand than there is supply. Um, and that's just true in the early stage and late stage. The, we, and we invest both in early stage and late stage. In the late stage, the correlations are much stronger, and that's because the bigger and bigger a company becomes, the more and more they look like a publicly traded company, and so the more the public multiples and the valuation mechanisms in the public market apply. And so bigger and bigger companies, they lend themselves to far more analysis of this kind. I think in the early stage, there's a very, you know, it gets back more to honesty than data in the early stage. Yeah, okay, so you describe exploratory versus confirmatory data analysis. And I can think of examples where this would be useful, uh, where either one would be useful as a venture, a data-driven venture capitalist. So the exploratory idea is you basically say, you know, it would be really interesting if we had a report of X. Maybe it would drive some questions or it would drive us towards understanding systematic bias. And then you also have the uh, the confirmatory data analysis where you say, I have hypothesis X and I want to create a data set that will back me up. So could you give an example of, of each of these, like when you've done that recently, yeah. at, at maybe at Redpoint? For sure. So exploratory data analysis is um, actually a lot of the, the blog posts I write are exploratory. They start out that way. Um, so a founder asks... One, you know, one day a founder asked me, hey, what's the optimal seed round size to raise? Right? It was a friend. He was raising a seed round. Like, Good question. Completely legit. I yeah. Mean, <laughs> right? like, and uh, I didn't have the answer. So exploratory data analysis. What, you know, is there one? Mm-hmm. And if so, what is it? Yeah. I had no idea. And it turns out that um, anything above, at the time I ran the analysis, probably 18 months ago, anything above a million and a half kind of correlates to higher success rates. And it asymptotes. So. If you raise a million and a half dollars, your odds of raising a Series A, if you're in the U.S. and in IT, 
are about 30%. And uh, it kind of tails down from there, right? So at a million dollars, I think it's like 20%. And so that's exploratory data analysis. Like I didn't know, is there an optimal one? Where it is? No idea. Confirmatory data analysis is more, um, it's probably more, it's like, hey, we have this hunch. Is it true, right? It's not necessarily I want to create a data set that necessarily substantiates my hypothesis. It's I'm looking to prove or disprove that hypothesis. So uh, due diligence is that, right? Uh, a new company comes in pitching a, uh, um, a pizza delivery drone uh, that, um, that offers you a pizza for half the price of Domino's in half the time, right. right? Your hypothesis, if you're really excited about making this investment, is that the market for you know, pizza is, uh, could be grown if it were more convenient and less expensive, right? So now I'm going to go and create a data set, which is I'm going to go talk to people. I could run a survey monkey survey. I could talk to their existing customers or interview some ex dominoes executives. Uh, and I'm going to create a data set to prove or disprove my hypothesis. And that's confirmatory testing. Okay. Um, so let's see, I had a question about the exploratory aspect. Um, the so with this this the question of like what is the optimal seed size to raise how do you know if you have a big enough data set uh, a big enough sample size to actually say this information is is worthwhile because you know th that kind of question seems so dependent on what kind of company are you building like are you building a sales driven if you're building a sales driven company probably you you know it's better to raise a lot of money because you need to hire a bunch of salespeople if you're if you're building a self service consumer app like Dropbox, I mean, maybe you need some customer service people, but it's, uh, you certainly don't need salespeople that need to pay a bunch of money. And then so there's all these different tiers of like how much money you should need. Um, and, and, you know, maybe if you had a sales driven company that wasn't raising a lot of money, that would actually be a bad sign. And if you had a, um, a consumer, you know, a B2C company where it's self-service and the cust and the customers don't really need a whole lot of inter interaction, you could just have two founders building it. Uh, maybe it would be a worse sign that they would raise a lot of money. So how do you know that you have a big enough data set where you're not going to have like noisy problems with your exploratory data analysis? Yeah, you do this thing called a t-test. Okay. And uh, it's um, it's a statistical test that compares uh, two different set data sets and tells you whether or not um, they're different, whether or not the mean of those two data sets is different. So... The way I ran this exploratory analysis is I said, okay, take all the seed companies, which I defined, I think I defined as anybody having raised less than $3 million in a single round, bucket them by tiers of $300,000, and then look at the, the average follow-on, the Series A rate, and then you, you put in this t-test, and it, the t-test considers the sample size, how many different uh, startups you have in each bucket. It also considers the variance in success, um, and it tells you with this thing called a p-value, um, whether or not um, they're statistically significant to a certain degree. So, ah. And we could have a whole other hour on the, <laughs> the thing of the p-value because it's really contested in statistics. Sure, p-hacking. Yeah, it's basically the best tool or proxy or approximation we have for determining that two means of two samples are different. Okay, um, so a couple more questions. Um, one, so we talked a bit about the investment in Dremio, which we actually had a show about drill with uh, Tomer. Um, Sharon. Tomer Sharon, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it was a really interesting show. Um, and investing in the data engineering market seems so complex to me because <laughs> yeah. how do you know where things are going? And it's like, you know, you look at an investment like Docker and it looked like a really, really good, I mean, oh, look, I, I don't mean to insult Docker or anything. It was like, um, and they have a great team, uh, great product. Obviously, tons of people are using it, but now they're having a, some issues finding a business model, and maybe it'll be hard, it'll be less appealing to invest in now. Um, and I just say that not again, not to insult Docker or anything, but just because it's so hard to see around the corner of these infrastructure companies, and it seems like we're entering this age where there's not like a cyclicality where. Uh, you know, you get expansion and then consolidation. It looks like just expansion, <laughs> yeah. right? Like I don't see any reason why things would consolidate in the near, in the near future, especially because you just have this like explosion in companies and explosion in, in in cheap infrastructure providers, and then you have like serverless, and serverless is going to introduce a whole host of new types of 
uh, you know, infrastructure platform. So how do you make, like, it seems like there's just so much I don't know, time horizon risk or whatever you want to call it, um, invest for investing in, in data infrastructure companies. I guess, was it more about the fact that you saw how useful, uh, Dremel was at Google. And so it was very, it was an easier investment to make because you saw how much of a step change it was there. Yeah. Um, it, well, so Dremio was an investment that we led after researching the sector for about a year. Wow. And, um, uh, you know, through conversations with different people, um, and particularly at Looker, we were looking for adjacent areas of opportunity. And, uh, so we had this hypothesis that there, um, that like big businesses like Informatica weren't going to be, you know, they had seen their heyday and there was going to be a new, a new, new kind of software and a new infrastructure to move data around and manipulate data. And, because of, of our investment in Looker, you know, we, we understood what was happening in the BI tier. And the, the, corner, the keystones to that investment were we believe that like, databases were getting much faster. You didn't need a data warehouse anymore, a data cube anymore. And that this data modeling tier that we talked about before, those were all kind of key innovations. And so if you change something at the application tier, the whole value chain or the whole data supply chain is going, will change, right? And then the other thing that was happening is the number of different databases being deployed within these enterprises. And I don't mean aggregate count, I mean flavors of database. Like it used to be everything spoke SQL. Like, and it wasn't all ANSI 92 SQL. I mean, you had like Ingress and MySQL and uh, Oracle and uh, you know SAP or whatever. Um, but now you have like, you've got a Cassandra thing, you've got an Elastic, you've got, um, you know, a Hadoop, you know, you, you've got like, you know, 15 different Mongo, all these different data structures. And so you have this new experience in the BI world, in the analytics world, and you also had this change, which is basically massive fragmentation. You know, you had fragmentation in the BI world the way that we talked about, right? Like the CIO of that Fortune 500, all of a sudden he's got to serve many different constituencies. And then you have massive fragmentation in the supply, which is data supply, all these different databases all look different, they all talk different languages. And so you have this new problem that data engineers face, which is how do I get all these different data from all these different sources into all these different sinks? Yeah. Uh, were you looking at GraphQL around that time also? Because it yeah. seems like GraphQL tries to solve that problem, but I guess it, it's kind of a slightly higher level than Drill, right? Yes. So GraphQL is a Facebook. It's a Facebook API definition that allows you to put effectively structured information into a serialized format. Yeah. Um, so I mean, is there? I guess I guess you could you could look at that. You could see both of those succeeding. You could see like people wanting to solve that. Uh, that data um, heterogeneity, database heterogeneity problem at the lower level with Drill, and then also at the higher level with GraphQL, depending on how their company is structured. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, you know there are other considerations when you're an enterprise, which is speed, uh, permissions, um, and you might want to do some data transformations in the middle. You know, there there are other things that you might want to do, and then the question is like, okay, where do where do you put this GraphQL layer that's going to make all these transformations? What what environment actually hosts that? Who manages that? So I think you know GraphQL is definitely a good, um, a big innovation. I'm excited to see what happens with it. Um, but yeah, so so Gemio, we looked for a year for this business, and uh, and then I, I'll never forget it. One day um, we met Tomer and Jacques, and like I think with the first five minutes, I was like, <laughs> 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 I I knew. And then we competed like hell to uh, win the right to invest in the business, and uh, we were lucky. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and so when you look at a business like that, do you, um, are you thinking about business model up front? Are you thinking about like the, the kinds of revenue they can make or are you uh, basically look for like just the technology and like the people that know how to use it and just assume that they're going to figure out a business model? I think uh, we had a sense for what the business model was going to be. Uh, I, you know, um, in open source businesses, this notion of like an open core, yeah, right. Uh, so we had that we had that framework for a business model. At the time we invested, it was only two people, and they hadn't built a product yet. Sure. So it, we couldn't. I couldn't enumerate the list of features that were in the free and the paid tier. Um, but we did have a good sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, that seems like a good place to stop. Yeah. Tomash, thanks for coming on the show. Um, it was a pleasure. Thanks yeah, for winning with data, great book. I highly recommend it. Um, looking forward to, do you have uh, any ideas for your next book? <laughs> it's going to be a while. 
that one we had 90 days to write. Yeah. And uh, we started November 1st and we finished February 1st. So it it was a sprint. Uh, I right. think I'll take a little break. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and your blog, what do you blog about? Just for so listeners know. Yeah. It's tomtungus.com and it's uh, data driven analyses on startup topics. Got it. Okay. Well, you can check that out, listeners. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash se daily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash se daily. Thanks again, Symphono. Wow.